Hi, this is Kevin. Welcome to my lecture on Chapter 2 of the Zell 3rd Edition Python Programming Book. And this uh, uh, ch chapter is about writing simple programs. As is uh, typical, I'm going to leave the objectives for you to read by yourself. Um, so, in this uh, chapter, the author uh, talks about the process of creating uh, programs. And we begin here by saying it's often broken down into stages. And I, I think that most experienced uh, programmers would agree with that. And um, so, uh, we ought to talk about the stages or, or phases of working on a program. So the first one is analyze the problem. Figure out exactly the problem to be solved. Try to understand it as much as possible. So we've got really two scenarios here. Um, one is you're taking a class, okay? And the problem that you're trying to solve is written down somewhere, OK? Uh, in, in my classes, uh, uh, typically uh, we're working on coding assignments. And each uh, coding assignment has a set of instructions. And the assignment is broken up into exercises. And the way to analyze the problem first is to read the problem, read the write-up on the exercise thoroughly. Okay, you might want to read it more than once to make sure that you're not missing any small parts. Okay, in the real world, um, there are situations in which uh, people will send you the requirements that a program has to meet and they'll be written. Um, Sometimes you'll read them and there'll be ambiguity. You'll have questions and so you'll have to talk to a person. Quite frequently, there won't be any written statement of the problem. You'll have to go talk to whoever the client is and come to understand their problem or opportunity um, and try to help to focus that in terms of a program or programs that are going to have to be written. OK, and you're going to want to make sure that you really understand it and you're going to want to make sure you haven't missed any parts. Um, if you are the person who uh, is talking to the client, you might want to write it down yourself and then show that written version to the client. Walk through it and say, do I have all the parts of the problem here? Right. So that's what we mean by analyze the problem. Fully understand what problem we're trying to solve or what opportunity we're trying to capitalize upon and the details of that. Determine the specifications. And by this, we mean program specifications. It describe what exactly your program will do. Don't worry about the how. Uh, worry about the what. So it, this would include uh, describing the inputs and the outputs and how they relate to one another. Create a design. Formulate the overall structure of the program. This is where the how of the program gets worked out. It, it, develop your own algorithm that meets the specifications. And uh, again, another useful word that you could use to replace algorithm would be recipe. OK, one of the things that we're going to find out when we start to write these programs is that programs, you know, kind of fall into types and they follow a pattern, right? And so it's going to be frequent that we'll see we'll see a problem that we're working on and then we'll go, oh, 
you know, that's like the program that I wrote that did such and such. Okay, and then we're going to emulate that. So um, as much as create a design, another thought here is uh, try to recognize some kind of a design pattern that we've used in the past um, and then emulate that. Okay. Implement the design. Translate the design into computer language. In this course, we will use Python. Okay, sounds good. Test and debug the program. Try out your program to see if it worked. If there are any errors, or bugs as we call them, they need to be located and fixed. This process is called debugging. Your goal is to find errors. This is a good point. So that everything that might break your program has been found. So um, there was a very influential book uh, written more than 40 years ago by a computer scientist. And he said in a in a kind of surprising way, the purpose of testing is to discover errors. Okay, uh, it's not to prove your program correct, right? Uh, it turns out when you you take a kind of a mathematical approach to figuring out what it would it take to prove a program correct, there's so many paths through a typical program that um, it's not feasible to prove a program uh, correct. So you really have to turn your ideas around here and say, if you can't prove your program's correct, then what you want to do is you want to find as many errors as you can possibly find before you say this uh, program is ready for clients to use, ready to put into production. OK, um, now um, a couple of things that help with that. Um, when we begin, um, the kind of testing that we are going to be doing is what I call uh, testing by inspection, which is to say we're going to run the program. OK, and it's going to it's going to uh, take the inputs and it's going to process them and it's going to uh, create the outputs. And then we're going to inspect the outputs and uh, decide whether or not uh, we have uh, discovered any errors on that run. OK, it turns out that we've learned that we do better at finding errors. Again, that's why we're testing. We're trying to find errors. We'll do better at finding errors if, before we run the test, we know uh, what scenarios we want to test. OK, we're going to come in this course to call them test uh, cases. How many test uh, cases have we got? And then what input um, it's going to represent that test uh, case. And what output are we predicting that we're going to see? Uh, and it turns out, human nature being what it is, that if we have um, agreed upon inputs and predicted outputs, we're much more likely to find errors. Uh, the kind of testing where you kind of fool around with your program, you uh, type in some input and then you see the output. Human nature is just to say, well, that looks about right. OK, we have a kind of a confirmation bias. OK, so the more specific we can be about the different uh, uh, cases that we're trying to test and what exactly the input's going to be for each of those and what output we predict, the more efficient we're going to be at finding the errors. OK, and that means that fewer errors are going to be found, fewer bugs are going to surface after we release this uh, code to uh, clients and put it into production. And then 
the programs have a life after we release them to clients and put them into, into production. We need to maintain the program. And maintaining the program has, has uh, two general aspects. One is that we're going to continue to find errors even after we put the program into production. So we're going to get problem reports about our code, and we're going to have to decide is that truly a problem uh, or is that a feature? Is that a bug or is that a feature? It's just, uh, it's a feature if it turns out that it meets the requirements and the user just misunderstands what the program is uh, supposed to do. It's a bug if uh, it's making some kind of mistake. Okay, so we have to do that over the life of the program. But the other thing that happens uh, is that these programs evolve over time. And that's because the requirements are change, and that's because the world is changing every day. And um, as the world changes, our organization has to adapt and uh, the software that we write helps our organization serve our uh, clientele uh, and our organization has to adapt and that means our programs have to grow and change over time so it turns out that if you look at the life cycle of the program this maintain the program uh, phase of it it goes on a long time and it could involve a lot of work So, um, as an example of program, um, the author has uh, cooked up this thing that he calls a uh, temperature converter, and it eventually becomes a program called uh, convert.py. Uh, and um, uh, when, when doing a analysis, Oh, okay, here's a statement of the problem that the author thinks is relevant. The temperature is given in Celsius. The user wants it expressed in Fahrenheit. Okay, so we think we understand the problem. So the specification, um, what's, what's the input? Well, the temperature in Celsius. Um, what, what, is uh, the output, the temperature in Fahrenheit. This last line here is just uh, showing us the formula for making that happen. So we might have a statement in Python uh, um, in which we might say output equals 9 fifths times the input plus 32. Okay, now that's not exactly Python, but it's close. Okay. Okay, so uh, how are we going to design it? Well, um, in the text, we talk about uh, probably the very, the most uh, general of design uh, patterns uh, that we're going to learn about. And a design pattern is a kind of tried and true approach to solving a problem. We're going to talk about them a lot in this uh, course. And there is a very simple one, very kind of high level uh, general one called uh, input process output, IPO. Okay. And according to the input process output design uh, pattern, you can really take any program, or you can take any sub uh, part of a program and uh, categorize the, you know, the action that goes on as getting the input or doing the processing or producing the output. And it turns out that that helps you in organizing your program. Okay, so we're going to use that uh, general design uh, pattern. So we're going to prompt the user for the input. That's the input part. That's going to be the Celsius uh, temperature. We're going to process it to convert it to Fahrenheit using uh, 
the general formula, it looks like the capital F is uh, Fahrenheit and the capital C is centigrade. And those are kind of maybe scientific notation. So uh, uh, Fahrenheit equals nine fifths times the temperature in Celsius plus 32. And then we're going to output the result by uh, displaying it on the screen. Okay, so that's our design phase uh, thinking for the program. Um, before we start coding, let's write a rough draft of the program in pseudocode. Now, pseudocode, uh, the fact that the author talks about pseudocodes is one of the things I like the best about this uh, book. So pseudocode is a a design uh, tool that helps us uh, kind of organize our design uh, thinking in a fairly concrete way without going so far as producing the end Python code itself. So pseudocode is typically a, a mixture of uh, English, I guess if, you, if you're doing a pseudocode in English, if you're doing it in some other language, well then uh, uh, it would be that language. And whatever language you're going to implement the program in. So here for us, it's going to be a combination of English and Python. Okay. Pseudocode is precise English that it, it describes what a program does step by step, okay? And it, it, it's precise English in the following way. Its goal is to eliminate ambiguity about how we're solving the problem. Um, it's sometimes a, a kind of, um, it's a terse way of writing English. So it's not always proper literary grammar and punctuation, okay? But it's precise in that when we're done with this, we hope that we've squeezed all the ambiguity out of the design. So using pseudocode, we can concentrate on the algorithm, read recipe, rather than the programming language, uh, okay? This is especially important for beginners who are often um, very frustrated by how hyper literal the Python interpreter is. So the Python interpreter wants every character exactly right. Any punctuation has to be perfect. All the indentation has to be perfect. So just typing the program in uh, is going to be, at least in the beginning, for the beginners, it's going to be pretty frustrating. So um, having an opportunity to write it out in pseudocode, uh, which is more forgiving than uh, Python, is, is a good idea. Okay, so here's what pseudocode might look like for the design that we have. Remember, we're following the design uh, pattern, input process output, IPO. So uh, it's just got three pseudocode statements. Input the temperature in degrees Celsius. Call it Celsius. So I think what he's saying in parens is that this is going to be our variable name. Calculate Fahrenheit as nine fifths times it is Celsius plus 32. Okay. And then output at Fahrenheit. Okay. So this is, uh, this is, it kind of gives us the general idea. We can say, are all the parts here, all that kind of stuff. And now, we're going to convert it to Python in the next step. Okay, so here's a program, um, the temperature uh, converter, and uh, it appears here on the slide the way it appears uh, in the text. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring over 
that program opened up in uh, PyCharm. Okay, and I'm going to make this text a little bigger. Sorry, there it is. Just because we've been looking at really big uh, uh, type. So, um, it, so this is the program exactly as it comes from the author, uh, John Zell. Uh, it, it's a decent program. It's a bit uh, professorial and old fashioned. And I'm going to show you a version in a couple of minutes that's uh, refactored. I talked about that in the first lecture. Refactoring is taking code that works, okay, and then uh, uh, changing the code to make it easier to read, easier to test easier to maintain okay um but this is exactly as we got it from the author he includes this um he includes a comment with the name of the file we don't really need that because we can look up here in our tool and see what the name of the file is uh he has a regular uh comment that says a program to convert Celsius attempts to Fahrenheit. That's a pretty good statement of intention. Uh, he has a line that says who the programmer was. And certainly somebody could say that in a um, in a uh, comment. The fact is that people don't really do this in the field. Uh, most people who are working with a team of people uh, to uh, collectively uh, uh, create a body of code. We'll use a code version uh, control system like uh, Git, G-I-T. And uh, one part of Git is you can look at who made what changes to which of the programs. And so putting this information into a comment is kind of old fashioned, not the way people would do it now. Okay, so let's look at uh, uh, the code. Again, uh, uh, because we have a small uh, program, all of our code goes into main, okay? The main function eventually is going to be um, a coordinating and orchestrating function that's going to call other functions, but that's uh, five chapters down the road or four chapters uh, down the road before we get there. So right now all of our code is in domain and then we call me. Okay, so the first part he does the input. Um, he has a variable is Celsius, okay? And then he assigns it a value, and the value is the combination of calling the input function, which will print out the message. What is the is the Celsius uh, temperature? Wait for the user to type in a response, okay? And then that response is going to be fed into the function eval and eval um as he says in the chapter eval is uh, kind of old-fashioned and it's not really secure because it's easily hackable but it's a really convenient way to turn a number that is input as text like oh let's say that we answered zero Okay, what's the Celsius uh, temperature? Zero. Um, now, eval would turn that character I I string zero into a proper number zero, and uh, it would assign that value to the variable Celsius. Okay, and then on the next line, uh, we calculate um, the output is 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 uh, assigned to the variable Fahrenheit, and it's an assignment which is an equal, and then we say nine fifths times Celsius. That was the input uh, value plus thirty two. 
the thing that I don't like about this is I want parentheses around nine fifths times uh, Celsius. The rules of Python are such that it'll be calculated the right way, but it just isn't enough. Um, it is enough hinting to the reader about how this is going to be done. We want we want the reader to just be um, really easy to read, right? It should it should read like a children's book. And then the last thing we do is that we print the temperature is so that string, then a space, then the value that's in the variable Fahrenheit, then an, another space and then degrees Fahrenheit, period. OK, so it, 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 and then, of course, we're not going to do main when we define it. We're only going to do it when we call it here on, on line 10. So if we run this, OK, and it says, what's the sense of the Celsius uh, temperature? And we give it a 0. It'll say the temperature is 32.0 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we run it again, I've got to pull this over so we can see my run again uh, button. Uh, if we say the Celsius uh, temperature is 100, that's the boiling point for water, uh, it'll say the temperature is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So that seems to work fine. Now, um, I think there are a lot of bad habits in this uh, code that I don't need to pick up just because it's in our textbook. Our textbook is great because of its computer science point of view. Um, it's really well thought through and really well organized and has a lot of good uh, ideas. Uh, the code is a bit old fashioned and, and academic. OK, so we're just going to refactor each of these as we go through. And this is what it would look like. OK, so um, there's no uh, comment with the name of the file that this is in. You just have to look at, at the tab. OK, instead of using a regular uh, comment to document the intention of the program, we do it with a doc string. OK. Now this is just uh, it's it's a fairly short phrase, so we put the triple double quotes on the same line as the string itself. Okay, we skip two lines because we always skip it two lines before a function and after a function. Okay, then we have the call to main. And then we have a empty blank line after that call. The Python style guide says we should do it like this. OK, now another thing that you're going to see is that all of the character strings that I have on lines uh, 5 and 7 um, are given apostrophes to uh, delimit them. That's a little more modern and less old fashioned than the double quotes. The double quotes will work. I wouldn't consider them wrong. I just consider them stodgy. OK, so we've got the same code here on live five. OK, where we um, these nested functions is functions inside of uh, functions always execute from the inside out. OK, so what fires off first? Well, input and it it writes on the console. What is the Celsius uh, temperature? OK, and then eval, it turns that a character string value into a number value. And then the assignment to Celsius, um, then that number value is associated with the variable Celsius. On line six, I added parentheses around nine fifths time Celsius because that's a better coding practice. Okay, 
There are rules about how Python evaluates expressions in the absence of um, proper groupings with uh, parens. Um, and that's called something like the order of operations. Um, that's uh, something that you should maybe know, but uh, something that you should not have your reader rely upon uh, if you're going to do this multiplication uh, and then do the addition, well, you should put the parens in to make that clear. And then the last thing is that we print the answer. And the kind of printing that we're doing here, each item that we print is going to print out and they're uh, separated by commas. And uh, uh, the Python print function will put one blank space in between the items. That's the reason why we don't need a space after is in this uh, opening string and why we don't need a space before degrees. Okay, uh, by the time we finish with chapter three, we're going to be formatting these with a, a special kind of a string called an F string, but we're not going to get there in chapter uh, two. And it's important to know how this kind of a print works as well. So if we run this, okay, uh, what is the Celsius uh, temperature? Uh, zero. The temperature is 32.0 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we run it again and we say, well, what is the Celsius uh, temperature? 100. Uh, the temperature is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so um, this first version, convert.py, uh, is right from the book, okay? This second version, the refactored one, I created by applying um, uh, all of the good practices that we're gonna follow in this uh, course that go beyond uh, uh, the textbook. Uh, I've applied these and I've refactored this and again, what do you do when you refactor? We take code that already works, okay? And you change it to make it more readable, more testable, more maintainable, okay? And most of the changes that we made, oh, and and uh, another thing is, is uh, you don't want to look like a rookie. <laughs> so uh, less embarrassing, all right? So that's uh, that. Okay, the next couple of slides we talk about this program and I'm not going to uh, talk about that. Okay, in the chapter we talk about names. So uh, we have to give names to things like variables and functions and all this. And these are called identifiers, okay? The, um, and every identifier, every identifier must begin with a letter or underscore followed by any sequence of letters, digits, and underscores. Identifiers are case sensitive. Okay, so let's look back here. Okay, uh, all of the identifiers that we have here are single word um, identifiers. Okay, they're all lowercase. So the names of functions, all lowercase. The names of variables, all lowercase. What if you wanted to have multiple words? Okay, well then we separate the words with underscores. Celsius value, okay. Fahrenheit value. Okay, and one expression that we have for this all lowercase naming with words um, separated by underscores is it's called snake 
case. Okay, because it kind of looks wiggly like a snake. Also, it's the Python way. A Python is a snake. Snake case. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so now we're going to undo those. Okay. So uh, that's how we're going to do that. Now, we'll we'll be introduced to other things in Python apart from the names of functions and the names of uh, uh, variables. And they might be in other uh, kinds of cases. OK, OK. But um, for function names and variable names, all lowercase, separate multiple words with underscores. And we call that snake case. OK. Um, these are all different valid names. These are all valid names, but um, everything that starts with a capital uh, would only be proper if it were the name of a, a class. OK, I'm sorry. I went the wrong way. So the only thing that I see is that is a proper variable name or function name is lowercase spam. All these other things have some problem that they wouldn't be proper names for variables and functions. And those are the things that we're naming right now today. Uh, some identifiers are part of Python itself. They're kind of uh, built in. And these are known as reserve words or keywords. Uh, and we're co we'll come to recognize them as we learn more and more. But here are some of them. And del for delete, for, is, raise, assert, elif, in, print, OK, we haven't seen all those yet, but they're all um, reserved, which means that we can't use them. Now, if we wanted a name like that, we could combine that word with an underscore and another word to use as a modifier, and we'd be fine. Expressions. OK, well, here's where some of the real uh, calculation uh, goes on. So the fragments of code that uh, produce or calculate new data values are called expressions. OK. Literals are used to represent a specific value. OK, so uh, a specific number value, like 3.9 or 1 or 1.0, those are numeric literals. OK. Uh, simple identifiers can also be expressions. OK, I think that we're saying that even the name of one identifier is the trivial case of an expression. Uh, also included are strings, uh, textual data, and string literals like hello, and again, uh, it's not super old fashioned, but a bit uh, to use the double quotes on strings. OK. Um, so what uh, what kind of expressions have we got here? OK, so we say x equal 5. So 5 is a numeric literal expression. Um, again, when we're at the console, if we simply type a variable name, it will print the value. So that's why we get the 5. If we say that we want to print x, well, it'll print the 5 that way too. If we say we want to print spam, it, it assumes that that's a variable name. And it doesn't know about spam. And so it gives us a lot of complaint. Okay, It gives us a name error. OK. Uh, 
simpler expressions can be combined using operators. And of course, we have the numeric operators, plus, minus, multiplication, division, uh, exponentiation. Spaces are irrevel irrelevant within an expression. Well, this is kind of interesting. So you can add extra spaces in between variable names and operators and things like that. And it will still be meaningful to Python. But one of the things that we're going to see is that um, in our course, we're going to follow this um, uh, standard for Python style called PEP8. And uh, it's usually pretty specific about how many spaces you put uh, 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 between things. And if you put extras or too few, it'll give you these squiggling underlines that uh, complain. Uh, normal mathematical precedence applies. OK, what do we mean by normal mathematical uh, precedence? OK. Well, um, um, sorry, that's very frustrating. Apologize for that. Um, there are rules about what gets calculated first and what order things are calculated in. Okay. So, um, generally speaking, okay, uh, 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 multiplication and division are stronger than addition and subtraction. So addition and subtraction uh, will be done uh, uh, after multiplication and uh, division. Uh, it, it, generally speaking, um, things on the left are calculated before things on the right. OK, so how would this apply here? Well, we would do this left grouping before the right. OK, so um, before we did the division, we would calculate the the parenthetical x1 minus x2 okay uh, we would also um, calculate 2 times n and then we would do the division and then we would have an answer for the left side okay and then we would do the right side so uh, we would do uh, a k to the third power, that's what this is, okay? And once we knew what spam, the value for spam was, and k to the third power, then we would do the division. Then we would have the value for the right side. And then the last thing that we would do would be the addition, okay? Output statements, okay. So, um, we're going to be uh, creating outputs with the uh, Python print function. OK, uh, if you do, if you don't put any. Uh, if you don't put anything between the parens, it'll just print a blank line. OK, uh, for right now, we're going to do a lot of these where we say print, and then we have some expression. Expressions are always evaluated by Python, and they take on some value. And then we print that value, OK? If we've got more than one expression, we can separate them by commas. And what happens is in the output, we get the value for the first expression. It skips a space the value for the second expression, it skips a space, and then it continues on. Uh, 
Successive print statements will display on separate lines, new line. A bare print, that's what he calls this, will print a blank line. Okay. So if you look at all these, let's see, if we say print 3 plus 4, it'll print 7. We, if we say print 3, 4, and 3 plus 4, then we have 3 space 4 plus space uh, 7. Print all by itself will give us a blank line. Print 3, comma, 4, uh, comma, end equals space. Um, um, and then we have a uh, comma, uh, print 3 plus 4. Okay, so we get on the same line, we get 3 from up here, 4 from up here, and then 3 plus, plus 4 equals 7. Implicitly, every time we call print, the very last thing that gets added on is a character at the end called a new line character, which skips to the next line. Okay, if we if we put this keyword variable here, end equals space, this overrides the uh, default for what goes on the end, and instead of a new line, we get a space. So instead of getting three, four, new line down on the next line and then seven, uh, because we said that the end for this was going to be this, we got three, four, seven, and then we got the new line. And then if we say the answer is comma three plus four, we get the answer is uh, seven. Notice how we didn't have to put a space after is in this first character string in order to get a space uh, uh, there. Um, by default, uh, every value in this list, um, as they're separated by commas, you can almost think of the comma as generating the space, although that's not uh, uh, technically true. Assignment statements are interesting. They're a really big part of how the code works. Um, right here, we're saying some general things, but let's go back to the program that we were looking at uh, before, the convert one refactored. Uh, this, where we say Celsius gets assigned this expression, okay? This assignment operator, the equal, that's what we're talking about here. That's an assignment statement. Fahrenheit, if you really want to be technical, I think you would read this. Fahrenheit gets assigned the value 9 fifths, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, when I read it out loud in class, I'll say Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths, blah, 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 blah. I don't mean that they're equal. I I mean that this is an assignment statement. But if you really want to be hyper technical and you don't want to be waylaid by um, how these actually operate, you could say for the equal sign, you could read it when you're being kind of narrating. You could say gets assigned the value. Okay. So that's what we're talking about here. So we're saying variable gets the sign the value from expression. Okay. The expression is on the right hand side, RHS right hand side. Uh, it's evaluated to produce a value which is then associated with the variable named on the LHS left hand side left hand side, right hand side. Okay. Okay, so here we say x gets assigned the value 3.9 times x times 1 minus x. If Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths times 
a Celsius plus 32. That's great. I would just want a parenthesis around the multiplication. And then x gets assigned the value 5. OK, so you don't need a complex expression. It's just a simple literal value or a simple variable name um, is the trivial case of an expression. OK, so that will always be sufficient on the right hand side, or it could be a more elaborate expression. Uh, the left hand side is always a variable name. OK. Variables can be reassigned as many times as you want. OK, now, is that a good idea? Well, if you're doing, if you're in some process, right, and it makes sense to give the variable various values over time, I think that's great, okay? Um, if you're really doing something else, just use another variable name. Now, I just want to point out that um, whereas I love this book and I love the author, my ver is not a properly formed Python variable name. It would be a, a proper Java variable name. Oh, OK, um, my ver in Python would have to have a would have to be in all lowercase and it would have to have a hyphen between my and and ver that would put it into a snake uh, case. Right. But the way that variables work in Python, you can keep assigning them different values. OK, um, that works just fine. So variables are like a box we can put values in. OK, and they kind of are right. Um, in fact, in some languages, like in the programming language uh, C, which isn't as object oriented as uh, uh, Python, uh, variables are associated with a part of the memory. Uh, uh, so um, variables have a space that kind of looks like a box, and you put one thing in the box or the other. OK. Um, so it's OK to think that this is the way that they work. So um, you can think of, of this statement, which recomputes x, right? You can say, before you started, the initial value of x is 10, OK? And after you execute it, it's 11. It's very important to not get kind of way late into thinking that this is a, a statement of some algebraic truth. This is just an interesting algebraic programming shorthand. What this really says is take the current value of x, add 1, resolve that and get an answer, and then put the new value back into x. So we begin with 10, we end with 11. OK, now, does that really work? I mean, are there really boxes that hold value in uh, Python the same way that they did in non-object oriented languages like C. No, because uh, Python is object oriented, it's a little more sophisticated than that. So uh, before, so variables um, um, are associated with value objects, OK? Because each value that we have is a programming object, OK? so. Uh, here, uh, before we executed this x, it gets assigned x plus 1, uh, x 
was associated with the value object integer 10. Okay, now what's the nature of that association? Can we say that x points to the value object? We would accept that there's this long history in programming languages that there were these things called pointers and people did lots of wild and crazy things with them and so pointers kind of got discredited okay and so um if it hadn't been for that uh you know kind of bad political patch associated with the word pointer, we would say x, you know, the variable x points to the value object integer 10. Okay. The problem is that we don't say that. We say it references it. Is that pointing? Yeah, it's pointing without the name that's been uh, discredited. Okay, he said it's like having a sticky note on the value that says this is x. Okay, it's kind of like pointing. It, what happens after though, we're not, so what happens is that when we recompute the value for x, what we do is that we reference a new value object. Okay. This is the value object for integer 11, okay? Uh, what happened to this integer value 10? Well, it depends on, on whether any other variable is pointing to it. It could be, okay? Anytime we have a value object that's not being pointed to by any variable, from time to time, there's a process that's run called garbage collection. And any value objects that are not being used, which means are not being pointed to or referenced by any of the variables, they disappear. They're, they're deleted. They're garbage collected. Okay, so if we go back a slide, it's kind of like we had a value in a box and we changed it, but it's more sophisticated because Python is an object oriented language, okay, we, you know, we are pointing to or more properly referencing the 10 value object. And when we're done, we're referencing the 11 value object and the 10 value object might or might not be a candidate for garbage collection. Input statements. The purpose of an input statement is to get input from the user and store it into a variable. Okay. Well, it kind of is. All right. The the purpose of this entire statement, and again, we've got these uh, these kind of angle bracket things to sit in place of real code. Let's look at a real one again that we used. Okay, so a real one that we used here was this uh, Celsius gets assigned eval of input what's what is the celsius uh, temperature so this entire statement um the input sends a prompt to the console we can see it down here and then the user types in uh some characters hopefully numbers we're trusting them for uh trusting the user for that to be numbers the eval is a um is a way to turn these number characters into a proper internal number object like an integer object or a or a, a float object we're going to learn about them when we get to chapter three and then because of this assignment uh operator then that value is associated with um, the variable Celsius. So that's what's going on there, okay? 
um, he says, the eval is wrapped around the input. And when we wrap functions around functions, uh, the more proper way to say that is that functions are nested inside of uh, uh, functions. When the evaluation goes on, it goes on from the inside out. First, we do input and we get the result. Then we do eval. Then we've evaluated the entire right-hand side. Then we do the assignment, which will, um, you know, point or reference this value object that is the result of evaluating the right-hand side. Okay. Assigning input. Uh, first, the prompt is printed. The input part waits for the user to enter a value and press enter. Okay, that makes sense. The expression that was enter is evaluated to turn it from a string of characters into a Python value, a number. This, this uh, the need to convert um, inputs that come in um, from the user from strings to these internal uh, numeric values this is always a little challenging for the beginner to uh, grasp, okay? Uh, numbers, when they go to the users, are strings. And numbers, when they come in from the users, are strings. The characters are the numerals 0 through 9, uh, and they might have a decimal point in them, and they might not, right? But when you get that in from the user, it's still a string. And you need to call some function to turn it into a proper internal number value. We'll see some more about that in chapter 3. And the easiest way to do it, and the one we're doing in chapter 2, is this eval. OK? So for string input, it looks like that. Oh, uh, now. Here's the thing. What if we're trying to get some input from the user that's not a number? Do we need to eval that? No, we don't. If we did, if we're, uh, you know, we're trying to ask the user, uh, what is your first uh, name, right? Well, we would have the variable would be like first underscore name. And then we would just uh, uh, say it gets assigned input and then we would have the prompt please enter your first name okay why don't we need to eval it well because we don't need to turn it into a number it's a string okay users type in strings and if we're just using it as a string well they just we just assign it right to the variable Beware of the eval function. We're not going to use it starting in uh, chapter three. OK, uh, why? Well, eval is very good at turning character strings with numerals in them into number uh, values. But it's also very, very powerful. Um, any command that's valid a uh, Python could be typed at the console. And eval just evaluates it. Right, so we could uh, we could do we could tell it to change data. We could tell it to you know to quit. We could tell it to do anything. So starting in chapter three, we're going to have some alternatives to eval, and then we're never going to use eval again. But for chapter two, absolutely fine. Um, I'm sorry. So what they could do. Uh, in by uh, typing in uh, Python code instead of uh, proper data. This is known as a code injection attack. Um, and it's generally uh, considered insecure to use eval for anything, even for your own work, right? Um, you never know who you're going to give that program to, right? You never know where it, it, it's going to go. So. 
we're using we used eval in chapter one we'll use eval in chapter two and then immediately in chapter three we're f we will uh, forget it and never use it again um simultaneous assignment okay several values can be calculated at the same time Evaluate the expressions in the right-hand side and then send them to the variables on the left-hand side. I'm going to go down, I'm going to go out on a, 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 a limb here and say this is a bad idea. Okay, this is something that works in Python. This is something that the author uh, demonstrates uh, in the book. And uh, I would say in most... Uh, coding shops, this would be uh, considered uh, a bad practice. Why? Well, we're doing three things. Well, here we're doing, well, at least three things. But put each one on its own line, uh, okay? Um, the thing that you have to remember here is um, it's not the case that um, the number of lines of Python code correspond to the number of lines of code um, once you interpret this language okay it gets down to a lower level okay so this one line of python code is going to generate a lot of low level code okay and and putting them on let's say we had three things here putting them on three lines is going to generate the same amount of executable code. This isn't going to be faster, okay? So this is a bad practice. Now, when we get to lists in chapter five, we're going to learn about uh, lists and tuples. There is, um, there is a way to have one expression on, on the right-hand side that will throw off more than one value. And when we do that, we call that unpacking rather than simultaneous assignment. And we're gonna learn when we get to chapter five that unpacking is a really good uh, practice. And we'll learn out why while we get to it. But in the short run, uh, you can forget about this. This was a bad idea. Oh, one exception. Okay, whenever I say uh, something's a bad idea, um, uh, then, then I realized that there's one exception. What if we want to swap the values of X and Y? Okay, well, then I think it's a great opportunity uh, to do it. So for instance, if we were if we were to say uh, x comma y gets assigned y comma x, which says swap the values, that's a perfectly good multiple assignment. Anything else, bad idea. Uh, here's where they've done that. They've done exactly that so they had x was three y was four print x y three four swap uh four three this is a uh, good code right the it doing this on uh, multiple lines requires a temporary variable to hold one of the values it's much harder to read okay but uh just having you know uh, four calculations on the right-hand side and four variable names on the left-hand side is uh, a wrong-headed idea. Uh, okay, so in this example, um, uh, he calls this uh, simultaneous assignment, but um, it's really not, okay? So, um, so, Here's what's going on. He's created a function called spam and X. 
and um, he prompts the user for more than one value. So he says, uh, enter number of slices of spam followed by number of X. Okay. Now he's expecting the user to know that he wants a comma in between those. So when we run this, um, it says enter the number of slices of span, follow up by the number of eggs, and then the user enters three comma space uh, two. And then it prints, you ordered it two eggs and three slices of spam. Yum. Okay, well, uh, first of all, if you want the user to type in a comma, to, uh, tell them to uh, type in a uh, comma. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, and so here's what's happening. What do, what do we have on the right-hand side? Um, we have got one expression. It, it, you know, it, the expression has uh, two functions that are nested inside each other, but it's it's one function. I, I mean, it's one one expression. What is it going to yield? Well, it turns out it's going to list. Uh, it's going to yield a list of values. Okay, uh, and so when uh, we assign that to two variables separated by a comma, we will unpack the list and place the values in spam and x. So this is an example of more than one value, more than one uh, variable, variable is separated by commas on the left hand side. This is unpacking and we're going to ch cover this in uh, chapter five. It's a great practice, but this is really not simultaneous assignment. Definite loops. Okay, so um, um, we can say uh, for variable name in sequence, and then we have the body of the loop. Okay, and uh, let's see what one of those looks. We've got a program uh, coming up, um, which I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes uh, more formally. And uh, let me make the code a little bit bigger. Uh, so for i, that's a variable name in range 10, that's a sequence. So that's a sequence of the values zero through nine. Uh, okay. And then we have the body of the loop. We uh, calculate one thing. So if we go back to, doesn't want to move, there it goes. If we go back here, that's what this is. Uh, this is kind of a, uh, well, a pattern for that kind of statement. Okay. So the beginning and end of the body of the body uh, are uh, indented, right? So we indent the body. And, and this is the simplest case where the body is a single statement. All right. Um, the variable that comes after four is called the loop index. Uh, it takes on each successive value in the sequence. Often the sequence portion consen uh, consists of a list of uh, uh, values. And we're going to meet, we're going to, um, we're going to explore that further when we get to chapter five. A list is the sequence of expressions in square brackets. So what does that look like? Well, um, it looks like this. So we say for i in, and this is another kind of sequence of one that we had just seen was a range, okay? This one is a list. 
and it has the values 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, and if we went around this and we said uh, print i, uh, we would print 0, 1, 2, 3. And then we say for odd in 1, 3, 5, 7, okay, print on odd times odd. So that's going to give us 1, 9, 25, 49. Okay, and what happens is that in turn, um, the Python infrastructure hands us each of these values uh, one at a time, one for each execution of the body of the loop. So the first time through, odd is equal to one. The second time through, it's equal to three, and then it's equal to five, and then it's equal to seven, and then we're done. Okay. Um, so back in um back in uh chapter one uh, we had a program uh, chaos.py and we uh we use expression range 10 okay and that gives us a sequence uh zero through nine and if we call the list function on that sequence then we get a list We'll find more about this when we get to chapter 5 and chapter 11, uh, which has the values of the range. So range is a built-in function that generates a sequence of numbers starting with 0. Uh, if you don't want a sequence that begins with 0, there are uh, different versions of the parameter list that you can use to have more control over what's in the sequence. And then list is a built-in Python, built Python function that turns the sequence into an explicit list. That makes it an instance of the list type. And then the body of the loop would execute uh, 10 times. Um, for loops, uh, auto the flow of the program execution, so they refer to as control structures. So certain of the statements that we learn about, sorry that this keeps hopping around, my bad. Uh, uh, certain of the statements that we learn about, like for, um, controls the flow of program execution. Uh, and for is the first of these control structures that we're gonna learn about. And this uh, diagram on the right-hand side is written in the programmer flowcharting language. And this was very popular when I got into programming 50 years ago. And it hasn't been popular in certainly 40 years um, because um, it's a language that allows you to describe things that are uh, not good coding practice. Okay, uh, And that's why we use pseudocode when we design um, uh, programs instead of flowcharting language. When I learned to program, which is about 50 years ago, uh, we would use this programmer flowcharting language. And this uh, language, a diamond is a decision, okay? Uh, rectangle is just, uh, uh, it's, a statement. It's a, a piece of action that has to be done. Okay. And these lines are flow lines. So we come in from the top. The first thing we get is the decision. Are there more items in the, in the sequence? If yes, um, then the variable, that index a variable, is going to get take on the value of the next item in the sequence and then we're going to execute the body and then we're going to come around and check and then finally when we ask if there are more items in the sequence and if we've used up the last one we have no and then it goes to the statement after the for loop okay and these are a little old-fashioned but sometimes they make it a uh, uh, kind of easy to describe uh, program flow Okay, so uh, we're going to do one more program and then we're going to wrap up the chapter. It's called Future Value and it's got, it's kind of mathy, but uh, this is uh, 
this is a typical thing that uh, consumers are interested in, right? Uh, we we put our money into uh, bank accounts uh, that earn interest, and we want to be able to predict uh, what this is going to be worth after some length of time. Uh, and this kind of um, uh, problem is called, uh, this whole uh, group of problems are called time value of money uh, problems. Uh, and most uh, uh, calculators that are worth their while these days have uh, functions on them that relate to time value of money. And one uh, kind of, oh, oh, kind of problem, a pattern is called future value. So um, future value works like this. You need, you need three uh, values as input. Um, you need to know um, uh, the principal. That's the amount that you're going to get. You need to know the interest rate. OK, and then you, you need to know the number of uh, periods uh, that um, it's going to continue to earn interest, right? So here we're saying that we deposit money in a bank account. How much is the account going to be worth in 10 years? Um, and I'm sorry about that again, given given um, the principal and the interest rate, okay? And then the output is going to be the value of the investment in uh, 10 years. And why did we pick this? Well, this is the kind of thing that you can calculate with a for loop, okay? So here's the specification. The user enters the initial amount to invest. That's called the principal. The user enters the annual percentage rate. That's called the interest. Well, it's called the interest rate. Um, the, uh, the specifications can be represented like this. OK. So this is kind of a program specification. Uh, in a world where uh, programs are designed by more senior uh, programmers and analysts and they're coded by more junior people, um, uh, they might, uh, the more senior person might write up a program specification for a more junior programmer to follow. So we, it includes the name. Oh, I'm very sorry about this. Um, it includes the name. It includes uh, the inputs, the principal, that's an amount of money. APR is a, a kind of term of art abbreviation for annual percentage rate. And he says here, express as a decimal number, it's really a decimal fraction. So I'm so sorry. This thing, every time I touch my mouse, it jumps. And I'm, this is uh, distracting. Um, and um, the output, the value of the investment in 10 years, the relationship, the value after one year is given by uh, the formula of the principal times 1 plus the average percentage rate. Now. I just want to point out that the average percentage rate has to be a decimal fraction. So for 5%, we're expecting the user to enter 0 0.05. He doesn't do a good job of letting the user know this. And so we're going to do this 10 times, OK? Um, and that's how we're going to get the value after 10 years. Uh, the the uh, design. This is pseudocode. Now, uh, first of all, I, want to, I want to point out, what do we do with uh, pseudocode? Do we, do we put it into our Python program? Uh, no, we don't. 
okay? This is the kind of thing that we jot down in a notebook. Or we might type it into a text editor in some kind of a dot .text uh, document um, that we'll want to hang on to. But this is, this is like a sketch that an artist would do before they would do a, a you know, a fine painting. Uh, uh, okay, it's for the use of the artist as they're producing. Okay, so print an introduction, input the amount of the principal, he calls it, I think he says here the variable is going to be principal, input the annual percentage rate, uh, he's going to call the variable APR, that's kind of vague, but it is a term of art, so that's okay with me. I I would have rather been explicit that it was going to be a decimal fraction. Uh, repeat the calculation uh, 10 times. The principal gets assigned the principal times 1 plus the APR and then output the value uh, principal. Okay. And the implementation, each line uh, translates to one line of uh, uh, Python code, print an introduction. He's showing us each of the parts. Okay. And then here's the program. And I'm just going to pull over uh, this uh, program in uh, PyCharm. And you can see uh, uh, that, again, we've got the comments at the top. We're going to rework those. He prints the introduction. I don't know why he needs to do it on two lines. Um, when uh, instructors are creating slides, and this has to go on a slide, they're always afraid they're going to run out of room to the right. So they're forever uh, doing things that are maybe not good everyday programmer uh, practice, but uh, make the courseware readable. So I wouldn't have put this into uh, two prints. Uh, we prompt and we get the principal. This is uh, chapter two, so we're still using eval to turn it into a number uh, type associated with the variable name principal. Uh, we do the same thing for uh, annual interest rate. I don't think we've given the user enough hint here that 5% is going to be 0 0.05. I'll show you how I fix that up. And then we just have this, um, we just have this for loop um, where we recalculate the principal and we go around uh, 10 times and we keep adding the interest earned to the principal and so when we're done with the loop the principal is the future value and then we say the value in 10 years is principal and then of course when we defined main we didn't say execute it we just said remember how to do it so now we have to call main. Okay, so if we run this program, okay, we can say, uh, how much is the principal? A thousand dollars. Enter the annual interest rate. Let's say uh, it's going to be five uh, percent. I put in five. Okay, that's a mistake. Okay, the value in uh, ten years is astronomical. Okay, so that can't be right. Okay, what did he really want us to do? Well, a thousand dollars. Okay, and 0 0.05 and uh, 1628. So we've earned 628 and changed 629 dollars in uh, 10 years at 5%. That sounds about right. Okay, so when I refactored this, I just cleaned up things, okay? Uh, first of all, I turned the comments um, into a doc string, okay? 
Uh, second of all, I took all of the all the character strings and I surrounded them with uh, apostrophes instead of quotes because I think that has a more modern kind of a look. Um, uh, another thing I changed is I changed the prompt uh, text uh, for this annual percentage rate. And I said, enter your annual, annual interest rate, enter 5% as uh, 0.05. So I think that's a little more user friendly. And then I do the calculation and then I, I print it. Okay. So again, this is going to run the same way, but a thousand dollars. Okay, now we know we should put in 0 0.05, and then it tells us it's about in uh, 10 years we earn about six hundred and twenty nine dollars, and that makes uh, sense. Okay, um, I don't think that there's anything after this. No, there isn't anything after this. Okay. Uh, so good. Uh, that's it for the chapter. Um, I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye-bye.